I did. Okay. Why don't we get started? I'm going to give Kevin a rest for a little while. Give them a rest. <laughs> I'll lecture a little bit today and probably tomorrow, and the rest of tomorrow we'll do it jointly. Okay. So I'm going to switch topics on the surface, or going to use many of the concepts that he introduced and uh, or we know from some of your previous studies. And what I'd like to discuss is the analysis of what's sometimes called personal management. Uh, that is, how people's inputs into various things affect their health. So you think of health. Well, on one hand, you say, well, it's mainly doctors, for, um, for example. But it isn't really. The more we learn about health, the more we know that the, uh, the personal management of different individuals is so crucial to the generation of health. And that differs across people, across families a lot. How does one analyze that? Yeah, that? That would be one thought. Or investments in other forms of human capital, uh, growth, uh, education, training. So the way that would be modeled now, let's say within a family, you say the family is investing in the education of its children. And basically, that depends upon the parental human capital, parental expenditures, child inputs, child ability, and the outcome of that would be cognitive or non-cognitive skills or human capital generation in general. The housing market. Kevin mentioned the housing market a number of times. We'll come back to it. But if you look at the recent episodes in the housing market, there's a lot of claims about that, well, People made mistakes, consumers made mistakes, they were fooled into uh, taking mortgages uh, and buying houses, um, that the, the cognitive the skills in the housing market were limited, or small print in credit card uh, contracts uh, uh, misled them into taking out uh, larger amounts on their credit card or paying it off less, less quickly. Now, whether these assertions are true or not, that, that, and, and how you put that in a broader context is something we'd like to discuss. But these are all issues of, of personal management. So, what I, the way it, I, I think it's a useful way to look at that is to build on what's been called the uh, household production approach, where households have technology and uh, they may differ across households significantly, even when preferences are exactly the same. We try to use that to generate um, an analysis of these, these types of issues. It's a general way of looking at consumption. And basically, what the household production approach does is separate the commodities desired by individuals, what ultimately enters the utility functions from the various in inputs of so the goods and services they buy in a marketplace would now become intermediate products, uh, not final products as often assumed, simple consumption theory assumed, but intermediate products into the production of these household produced commodities that generate the utility. So that, that's the uh, approach I'm going to uh, use and um, develop a simple analysis of self-management and uh, see how that uh, ties into the issues of production of health, human capital, maybe uh, cognitive mistakes, the different skills of different households in sort of achieving what they'd like to achieve. And basically, I think a, a good part of that can be come back to different productivities, uh, just as we have different productivities among different firms in the marketplace. So you can think of that also in the household. On this view, then, the households differ not only in, in income or wages, but also in the technologies that they have available to engage in this self-management. Okay. Uh, so they may have pretty similar tastes, or set the same taste, uh, assumption I often like to make about people. They have fundamentally the same taste in some fundamental sense, which we can 
get into about if you have any questions about that. But they differ in these other characteristics, characteristics that we have a, a good a, a chance of developing an analysis for and measuring. Uh, and that these differences can generate huge differences in household behavior, even when they have the same income, even the same wage rates. So that, that's, what, again, what we'll be trying uh, to do. And in doing this, We'll build on many concepts, and many of those that uh, uh, Kevin introduced in terms of production theory, some, uh, consumption theory, technological progress, or productivity change, inputs of labor, capital, and materials, concepts of separability becomes important in, in, in this view, in preferences and, and in production. So, Think of, now think of consumers or households as producers as well as consumers. That, that's the fundamental uh, starting point. Uh, simple consumption theory, which is fine for a lot of problems, and I, I certainly was still use it for a lot of problems, would say write down fundamentally depends upon are not these items, but on the things that households produce. So for example, health, uh, uh, housing services, uh, meals that they generate, conversation that they, they produce, child rearing, uh, production of children. That's an obvious example that uh, children <coughs> Not, you don't buy them in the marketplace, right? Household has to produce them, not only the quantity, but also much of the quality of children or the human capital of children. Now, these, are, these, these are basically produced. So one point of view is to say, well, let's look at the utility function where ZI is the ith commodity. And by commodity, I mean, that's how I'm going to use the word commodity, as, as the uh, goods that are produced by the household. Okay. Well, this is what the household, and this affects their utility. Now, if, if this approach is useful, one of the implications would be maybe there's a really pretty small set of commodities. You use a lot of inputs of goods and services to produce a small set of commodities, but these, these really deal with the basic desires of people. Uh, uh, Kevin mentioned Alfred Marshall, great economist of the, the latter part of the 19th century and early 20th century. Marshall had two basic commodities. He said desire for uh, distinction, uh, that is uh, to be you know, recognized as, as good at something, and, and the desire for excellence for its own sake. Now whether Marshall was right or not, uh, one could argue about, but that there's a small set of basic things that people want that are not that different among different people or even in different countries. It, 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 I think it's a good way to start looking at the problem. And what you, you, and what you want to do is take the thousands of go goods and services that people do in fact buy and uh, convert them into a small, relatively small number of basic ones. That's one of the motivations for uh, doing this. So uh, what we would then say would be that each of these commodities has a production function that will depend upon 
in a general set of n goods, and maybe a set of k k uses of um, time, maybe daytime, nighttime, and um, maybe it will depend upon education, age, and a lot of other variables. Where uh, x are market goods, h Household time, and household time is going to be very important in self-management. How people, by household time, I mean the time that people have to allocate outside uh, what, what they're doing for work, but what they use to uh, watch television, uh, eat a meal, invest in their human capital, invest in their health. Um, take uh, child care, uh, and all the other things that we know that uh, people do. And then E, for example, that might be the education. <coughs> A might be age. I mean, and, and you can think of many other variables. Now these could be, these a, a production functions could be very general, where you have multitasking, so I'm watching television and doing one of the problem sets that we've assigned at the same time. <laughs> right? um, not a productive use of time, I wouldn't think, but some people do that or listen to music or, or, or whatever. Uh, but I'm going to mainly deal with the simpler case of uh, where there's no joint production, no <coughs> multitasking. So by that I mean um, the goods I put into, into the production of the ith commodity uh, are not also used to produce other commodities. Now, the same units of the goods. I could have uh, different units of the same good being used for different commodities. So that, that's not joint production. Uh, joint production is when uh, I'm, the time I, I'm, I'm using to solve the, the these problems, I'm also using that exact same time to watch television or listen to music. That's joint production. And it's important, I'll, and I'll give an example later on, how you can use jointness to actually get additional implications that are interesting. But, but much of the problem, I'll, I'll, I'll assume, there's no joint production. Uh, so each each commodity takes different units of goods or time. This thing might be the same generic thing, but yeah. it's different. Different units, right? Like That's what crop them. Like you could put salt in a cake and salt on your French fries, right? Yeah. You can't put the same salt on your <laughs> right. French fries. You can't put the same cake. Salt. That's a good example. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. Uh, you can't do the same. So I could use time to uh, watch television, I could use time, evening time, same sort of time to do to do these problems. I'm not using the same time. I'm watching television and then I'm doing the problem and so on. So that, that's the difference between but Joint production, multitasking, and not. I'm assuming uh, no, no joint production. Okay. So, and so these can be different goods and goods, and these end goods, units of these end goods can enter into each of the commodities. This uh, time is going to be like different types of time: weekend time, evening time, morning time, uh, 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 and you're allocating them as well. All right. So then we would have then we would have Kevin, you did a lot of writing, so a lot of writing <laughs> actually. I was raising yeah. that word. But it should be all in your in, in your mind, <laughs> all, all the interesting things you put down. Budget constraint, conventional budget constraint, where we have x i j times p j, j running 
from 1 to n, i running from 1 to m, and that would be equal to your income, which I'm going to write as simply the wage times your hours of work, where L equals hours worked. W equals wage. I mean, you can have some other source of income here, um, property or something else, but I'm not, I'm not going to pay a lot of attention to it. So what? Uh, so this this illustrates that you may have the same J good. Some units are going into <coughs> commodity one. These are the commodities. Some units are going to commodity two and the like. Actually, I'm going to deal with it. Uh, I'm going to aggregate over it just for simplicity, uh, to deal with a, a, a similar formulation of this. So in each commodity, I'm going to assume, instead of having th this formulation, I'll assume there's an i xi, some aggregate of all the x's. Think of it as maybe a, a single good. Uh, but the aggregate of all the x's. And so I, I'm, I'm going to end up writing this as the usual way, uh, xi times p, uh, pi, i, which is 1 to m, is equal to i is equal to w, l. Okay. So that's, the, that's a good uh, constraint. Now, we also have a time constraint and it's going to be essential. Uh, so what's the time constraint? Well, I'll do the same thing for time. I'll, I'll, I'll think of just the number of, of hours of time in the production of the uh, ith commodity. And uh, so I would have the sum of hi is equal to t minus l. where t is equal to the total time. So it's a week, 168 hours per week, a year, 6,000 something, something hours per year, and the like. Okay. Now it's, it's useful uh, to think of, particularly, you know, if you're out of the labor force, so L is zero, Basically, you have, and you have to have some B here. Uh, basically, you have two constraints. You have a goods constraint and a time constraint. They're basically independent. Okay? Uh, but if you're in the labor force, so if L is greater than zero, it's useful to substitute this equation into that equation and get some xi pi is equal to i is equal to w times t minus sum of hi, and I say I'll, I'll neglect the uh, v now. Or by carrying this over to the other side, they'll think of the following equation, which is a fundamental equation, I think, in understanding a lot of household behavior. we have? On the right hand side, we have S, what I call full income. What do I mean by that? Full income, and W is the wage rate, you can get that for each hour of work. So if you worked all your hours, 24 hours a day, um, 168 hours per week, you would get W times T is your income. That's your potential income. Now, of course, Realistically, we'd like to make, we would want to make W maybe a function of how many hours you're working. You start working 20 hours a day. Even Kevin, his productivity would go down. Right? Uh, but uh, so the W will be a function of your hours of work. and maybe a function uh, of your goods consumption. Simple model, again, develop it for our purposes. Sufficient W is simply fixed. And W times T gives you potential income that you can earn over all. Uh, so this is full income, an important concept. I'll come back to that in a moment. And what we have on the left is how you spend your full income. You spend it partly on goods. And you spend it partly on time. So this would be called your foregone earnings. So 
No, full income is the sum of your goods expenditure and your expenditure on uh, household time and measuring the expenditure on household time by its opportunity price, namely, which is the wage rate. You give up W for each hour you spend in the household. And so the foregone earnings um, are W times H. So if you only were interested in maximizing your income, um, you spend all your time at work. But because you have an interest in maximizing utility, you uh, give up some earnings and, uh, uh, to spend time in the house. Okay. Maybe you have a question. You think about time. Is time, I mean, there's one version of this model which time is literally time. And then, but you can also think about like attention or energy or all kinds of yeah. other Time is more of a metaphor for some right. kind of endowment of capacity that you have. Right. I mean, so you don't want to necessarily take time literally. I mean, in some cases it's useful, like for commuting problems and stuff. We take it more useful literally. But well, you want to maybe supplement the literal aspect of time with other dimensions of time. So let's say I like to play tennis. And so if I'm going to play several sets of tennis, I have a amount of energy. Yeah. Unfortunately, not as much as I used to have, but a certain amount of energy. Um, that's where the A factor is, right? And so I'm not going to expend all my energy on every uh, game um, because I won't have energy later on. So you can think of this, as, there's a stock of energy also there. And it's like the T. You have an endowment. Exactly. The T is the endowment. Here's yeah, an endowment. So I could have, I could write down here, say, where do I have? Uh, oh, yeah, here. I write down here. I could also have over here some EI. Yeah. Equals E. I remember E. E's total energy. Yeah. Minus how much E you spent at work. Yeah. 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 And plus, yeah, I should have. Um, I would include yeah. work in this case, well, let's say E at work plus that. Like your L you had. Yeah. And actually, I, I once wrote a paper on, the, on division of labor uh, between men and women, arguing that, uh, that I put in an explicit energy uh, constraint like that and said, well, women are spending a lot of their energy in the household sector, raising kids and so on, that was traditionally what happened. They didn't have as much left over for work, so that would be a factor lowering their ability to earn a lot, make the wage rate now. And this and now let's make the wage rate maybe a function. W is a function of E W. The wage per hour. Yeah. Wage you could also hour. have like a wage per kilo kilowatt yeah. hour or something like that. Yeah. That would they be paid for time yeah. and paid yeah. for energy and paid for attention Absolutely. span. And yeah, all those capacities. All those things, exactly. And so I think it actually, not only is it formally adding it, but I think explicitly talking about things like energy can really give you some insights into some problems. So T could be a vector here. Yes, yeah. T could be right. a bunch of different, different things, exactly. Just like the X's are a vector uh, over different goods, right? We're aggregating up, they could be a vector. So if you wanted to understand like sedentary lifestyles and, and, and exercise yeah. and all those things, or, how much sleep? or yeah, look, Fogel, Robert Fogel, has uh, written a lot historically on the link between cal caloric intake and productivity, and arguing that in the past, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, and further, uh, people had low calorie intake, and therefore that affected how much energy they had, and therefore that affected their productivity of work, and therefore affected their income, which in turn affected. Uh, how much food they could take and affected their energy. It's an interdependent process. So uh, that's important in looking at some historical uh, <coughs> aspects. And again, in self-management, and as Kevin says, use the emphasis on time is just a representation of a, a lot of these risks. So I'll talk about time, but you think of it uh, more generally. I think it's a good point uh, to be aware of. Okay. Any questions? Now let me talk a little bit about full income. Um, full income.
income is like permanent income, although it doesn't have a time a over time dimension. But it it gets away, and that, that's a big value, of uh, from the fact that we allocate time differently at different times. We may be working part time. So our actual we're working part time and we go back to our actual income, I, well, uh, working 50, 20 hours a week, we'll have a low actual income. But our full income may be unaffected by that. Right? Given W, at least given W, uh, full income would be independent of how we're allocated. We're unemployed. Or, uh, so full, uh, actual income will be greatly affected by it. But full income can still say, well, that's like my long run income. My, my behavior is going to be adjusted in large measure to uh, uh, not the fact I'm only working part time or uh, maybe mainly unemployed for a period of time, but my potential income, which is the full income. And that's, that's, the, that's what we think of in the concept of permanent income. There we usually think of it as a variation over time, but uh, probably the biggest variation for most people is, you know, they're unemployed, they can't, they, they don't have a full-time job, so their income is varying for that reason. So it really comes down to full income as the, I think the major term. And full income enters into a lot of problems. Um, one example. <coughs> Health. Now, Kevin and Bob Topel, who teaches here, wrote an important paper on statistical value of life and measuring how, how important it is and disease and so on. And what uh, they showed there was that the main, main driver of how much people are willing to pay for improvements let's say, improvements in the probability of surviving different ages, uh, of course, that depends upon the value of, of the utility they would get from basically living longer. But uh, you can think of that utility in terms of not their income, but uh, some adjustment on their full income. So somebody who's not working, who's retired, still has a, uh, may have a very strong interest in lowering their mortality rate, and we observe that in the data, that people, old, older people aren't working, uh, they may be more interested per year in extending their life than younger people are, even though they're not earning anything. You don't want to think of income as your variable. Of course, you want to think of utility, but a, 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 an approximation to utility would be their full income. How much uh, people who aren't in the labor force have in terms of uh, consumption or in, uh, no income consumption, plus also the value of the time they're spending in the household. And in fact, that pops out of the equations that some adjustment of full income under some assumptions would be uh, the uh, right measure. So uh, a lot of the problems, not all, but a lot of the problems with GDP measurement is the fact that we don't use full income, we use actual income. You gave the example yesterday of the oil shop. Now, the oil shock uh, could raise GDP or could lower GDP. Um, and in good part, in, in, in fact, in, in entire part, that was occurring in, in the simple model that was put up there because of changes in the hours work. Uh, if, if the uh, income effect was uh, important, uh, they they would work more hours, so they look like they're getting more income, but they're not getting any more income. Right? Or if they're working fewer hours, it looks like they're getting less income, GDP goes down, but they're not really getting any less. Uh, so uh, thinking of full income as, as your variable um, will uh, uh, be useful in making comparisons, uh, changes over time, or in, across countries. I, I wrote a paper with a couple of other people a couple of years ago, in which we tried to calculate uh, the changes in full income in different countries of the world as a result of different mortality improvements in different countries. Now, if you just look at GDP, there's very little convergence across countries per capita GDP uh, from 1960 to the present, almost no convergence across countries. On the other hand, if you convert uh, if you look not simply at the growth in actual income, the growth in 
full income, so you adjust actual income for the increase, the value of the increase in life expectancy, put that, and, and make that calculation, there was a sizable convergence in, in, in full income, which is the more relevant measure of income. Okay. So again, uh, full income uh, comes simply out of this analysis, but it, it's the relevant one for a lot of welfare and other comparisons. Now, the reason full income is important because of the great importance of time. The fundamental, I like to say at least, the fundamental resource in any economy is the time of individuals. They, they can use that with time to produce human capital, so it determines how much human capital they have. They use that time for a lot of other decision making. Now in this analysis, we can think of how important is time in full income? How important is time in full income? How does the importance of time compare to goods? In one sense, time determines goods too. But if you look at, you know, given that people are have a certain amount of money income and and a certain amount of time spent in the household, uh, what would determine the relative importance of time? The household time. The wage. Well, one, one suggestion is the wage. So, importance of time. Importance of time. Wage. Put a question mark because now think about it. You get a higher wage. Okay, what happens? Well, the value of your time you spend in the household goes up, right? But the value of your goods will tend to go up as well. You just have more income, you'll spend more. So it isn't obvious that the wage is an important variable. What else? Yes. Your productivity within the household. Well, yes. Um, depends on. What you're measuring, you know, your productivity may affect the productivity of your goods as well as your time. Suppose we, yeah, maybe I'm, it's not clear. Suppose we ask, uh, we, we look at two shares. We look at share H is the share of time in total full income, W sum of H divided by S, and we look at 1 minus. SH is equal to share of X. Which is the sum of them. XI, PI, I know. Yeah. All right. You want to put that down there. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Now, does that give you any hint? Yeah. That was a good way You taught me well. <laughs> so. Well, let's write it down. Now let's do what Kevin says. I'm forgetting about the V. Uh, that would have some effect on this, but not crucial. Okay. So now let's say we want to look at what we have W on H over W L, right? Because WL, let me write it down, sum XI PI over L, right? So this is goods, this, that, and write WL. This drops out. W drops out of the problem. Uh, it doesn't completely drop out of that other sources of income, but would, to a large extent drop out. So what are we left with? We're left with W, sum of the household time over L. How can we imagine that? What, what do you think the magnitude of that is? Well, let me let's write it down. Remember, it's T minus L over L. Or you might want to draw a distinction. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I don't want to overemphasize things. Suppose you say there's a certain amount of hours you spend sleeping and other personal care, um, and 
that's maintenance. That's not uh, uh, production. So you need to do that. So I'm going to net that out even. Okay? So let's really say instead, let's call that equal to um, T minus pi uh, minus L over L. Okay? So on, on a weekly basis, T would be 168. Let's say personal care is 7. L is 40. So if you do that, you get approximately 60 over 40, 1.5. Time is considerably more important than goods in full income for most people and for the average. I mean, I took a 40-hour week as roughly uh, the hours. Now, in very poor countries, if they're working 60 hours a week or more, uh, uh, household time is less important. But, but in, in an economy like the U.S., where the average is actually a bit less than 40 hours per week, um, uh, then 1.5 uh, seems like a pretty good approximation uh, uh, to indicate that time, household time, is, is by far the most important uh, resource in, in the full income. The most important. Time is, of course, everything was based on time here, but in terms of household time versus good, household time is more important. So time would be let's say two-thirds, this implies, right, that time would be not two-thirds, but 60%, uh, so this would be 0 0.6 approximately, and this would be 0 0.4. Okay. All right, so you have to pay a lot of attention. I mean, so you think again of personal management. This shows why personal management is important, how well of course, you know how well you utilize the goods that you buy, how efficient you are, but how well you utilize your time is very important in determining uh, individual uh, welfare. And a lot, as we said earlier, a lot of the changes that we see, like in um, in uh, increasing length of life, is mainly adding time to your resources. Yeah. yeah uh, just a question, like wh how much control does the person have over L? Because there seem to be a lot of institutional things, like most of the people work full time. And currently, it's 40 hours, like in the 19th century, full time, you know, 50, 60 hours. It, so it, it might be uh, that, depending upon what the market conditions are, that they, I, mean, I haven't made any assumptions yet about how they arrive at L. Right, but it, uh, let's say one simple model would be they can uh, supply to work all the hours they want in a fixed wage. That's the simplest. Another model, maybe uh, it's more complicated than that. Uh, they can supply, uh, they, if they supply uh, too little hours, maybe they get a very low wage. If they supply 40 hours, which would be the norm, they get another wage. And then maybe if they supply more than that, they take a second job or they work overtime, they might even get a higher wage. So it may not be really what you're saying is what does the uh, wage profile look for different uh, levels of hours. And like I said, what, uh, a more general way of looking at the wage, instead of assuming it's a fixed wage, you might have it a function of different hours that you supply. So it might be. I mean, you can incorporate all those facts. But there's nothing special about this problem as opposed to the usual labor leisure choice uh, with, with regard to that. Let's say the usual labor leisure choice, you go back to this consumption, that CL uh, function, and you look for the uh, optimal you know, leisure time or, uh, and so on, you have exactly the same issue there, well, right? There are some reasons why you might be close to this linear case, right? I mean, you think about what minimizes cost for the firm, right? Just take the usual labor leisure problem and say, Gary's in, we're implicitly assuming that the guy is like close to this point, right? But think about what happens if the firm doesn't let him choose his hours and forces him to work less than he wants and more than he wants. Well, if you force him to work less, you've got to pay a higher wage. If you force him to work more than he wants, you've got to pay a higher wage. 
So the minimum cost minimizing wage from the point of view of the firms is to get close yeah. to that point. So the yeah, firms may have to take things in bundles. Well, so yeah, yeah. So firms have fixed costs. They push you over here. If you get tired, the more you work, they push you over here. But the point is, we at least have a theory that sort of says, like the difference between 1800 and now. The, the, the 60 hours was probably closer to what people would have wanted to work then, and the 35 hours is closer to what people want to work today. So, you know, some of that may be institutional no, changes, but a lot of it's endogenous. A lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, so, I think that's an important point to make. You know, that the markets, this is a general point, markets, if you're not responding to people's preferences, then there's some additional profit you could make by responding better. It's not that you're doing it out of altruistic motives, uh, but you make more profit. If you can meet their preferences better, then um, they'd be willing maybe to, uh, to work for less per hour or, or so on. So there's a profit motive. You don't want to leave what uh, we were discussing rent the other day. You don't want to, there's an incentive not to leave any what we call rent on the table, unexploited improvements in efficiency. So that's what competition does. That people are striving for additional profits, additional gain. Consumers are striving for additional utility. So you, you, you try to do it. Now, there may be constraints that uh, people are working on in a firm jointly. So if I'm, I can't be working 20 hours, maybe when everybody else is working 40 hours. Or maybe I can have two people working 20 hours. But maybe I can't do that perfectly. So you know, there, there are maybe technological limits on what I can do in that regard. Or we have legislation. You have people working more, more than 40 hours, we have to pay them overtime. Right? So, never, even that, people find ways around because, uh, well, I'll, let me not go into that. <laughs> but even the overtime provisions aren't, don't have as big an effect as you think it might have uh, because the, the people will really uh, work for bundles. Uh, that one job provides a lot of average overtime, so people. Uh, People like overtime, they'll be willing to work for, quote, less per normal hour to get that bundle, then, uh, uh, and therefore uh, uh, they may be ending up with no more uh, payment for a 50 hour week than they would get even the absence of any overtime. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. When you refer to full time uh, employees, what is that? Is that like the full time do you mean? I, I speak a little louder. Do you mean a full-time a household or an individual? If there is distinct more than one member in the household, you mean what do I? Yes. What do I mean? I'm going to come to that. The multiple households. So hold that question. Uh, if I don't answer it, uh, repeat it. Okay. So. I have a question. Yeah. Um, does it make sense, like in this framework, to exclude the time that you spent working from kind of production because? You know, like I can think of my full income as what would happen if I went to Wall Street and, you know, like five years ago and took that job versus taking a different job that has a lower income. Like, in some sense, I'm also engaging in production of things. Consumption on the, I mean, consumption. Oh, consumption, like, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I like Wall Street, uh, wherever, you know, a lot of people don't want to go to Wall Street now, but you may not like sometimes. So yeah, in general, uh, uh, a more complete way to, to write, to have written this household production, these commodities, I could have another commodity here, I'm going to call it DL, where that partly is a function of how many hours I spend working. We all have a strange and expensive hobby, basically. Oh, right, like <laughs> what which job, which job I take. And we right? say you take consumption at work. So. <laughs> Um, we're teaching, so presumably we get some utility out of teaching as opposed to something else we're doing, right? So yes, you could do it, you would, and so you would close it up. It wouldn't fundamentally change the analysis. Right. You, you could do that. But, the full, but then the full income measure would be much higher. Like yeah. every, everybody's actual like maximum income would be a lower bound on Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So for some problem, if you look at some of the literature, there's some problem People have tried to bring, uh, have brought that in to work, and then uh, you work out. Particularly when you look at optimal hours of work, you want to take account of the fact that when you're working, uh, you're not only producing W, but you're also producing Z of L. You're producing both of those, so you're getting two sources of income: increasing commodities, 
let's say let's say you're getting positive utility added or opposite for negative utility. And your and, and your earnings. And if you have a really dangerous job, they might have to compensate you for the loss of TV right. at the end of your life. There's things that go the other way. People sometimes they add commuting hours into work hours. Yeah. And so they're really part of earning the income or they even put a lot of goods into the work out. You know, I have to buy clothes to go to work. I have to do all kinds of stuff. One, one constraint you do know, however, at the margin, at the margin, you must get less utility out of your work than you do out of spending that hour in the household. Why do you know that? Because then you could lower your marginal wage otherwise. Or you'd keep working more. If I'm getting at least as much utility out of work, out of work, plus the earnings, I'm going to work more because the total pay is better. So you know, at the margin, it, what's true on the average, uh, for, for me, if they had to take away my work, that would be a tremendous loss to me. On the margin, though, I presume we're getting less utility. Yeah. Yeah. Works a bad. You have to be paid a bit more. On the margin, yeah. works a bad. Yeah. Yeah. You dislike right. work on the margin. Right. You dislike it relatively. You dislike it relatively on the margin. No question. That's an equilibrium. It's an important equilibrium condition. So you look at people, they may be complaining about their house. Uh, 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 they may say they love their work. Yeah, they love the work, but they're not learning it on the market. That's why people have kid, pay to have kids, but then they hire babysitters. Yeah, right. 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 Margins on the average are really different. <laughs> <laughs> the margin is greater than the average. That's yeah, the margin. Right. <laughs> okay, any other questions? These are all good questions. Okay. So now what can we do with this? Well, let me um, go over here. Let me come back. Bring this down. We can take the budget constraint that we had, the full income budget constraint, um, which was some, I'll rewrite it here, and rewrite that, recombine these things. Let's combine uh, the goods cost and the time cost for each commodity. So we would have. S, or let's introduce a new notation, um, pi i, z i, is equal to S. So pi i, by definition, is the average price. It's x i, z i, plus w h i, over z i. It's the average cost of a unit of Z. It's a shadow price. You don't go out and buy Zs. Uh, and it's an average price, um, not a, a marginal price. Um, but it's a relevant price uh, for uh, the household. Okay? The market is in X and Ls. But uh, what people ultimately interested, because that's what ends with the utility, is uh, the Zs. Now, you can think of now real full income, real full income would, would be approximately some S over some price index over these shadow, these commodity shadow price, not uh, I, money income over some market price index, but uh, full income over some Price in. That means, you know, you look at changes in prices, you, you do exactly what Kevin showed you did in the market. You can look at list pairs, you can look at pace, you can look at some Fisherian uh, uh, average uh, of patient list pairs or anything else, and look at changes in money. But that's, that's, that's what's relevant. And what's entering into this that doesn't enter into the market income or market flow income? Well, what's entering into the pies? What's entering into the pies? 
What's he turning the tires? Well, the price of goods, right? That's one factor. So go back to the definition of the tires. Price of goods, right? wages. So wages affect the commodity price index. Wages. What else? Productivity. Pro I will see that a little more explicitly, but productivity affects the household productivity is an important factor. So if households experience an increase in productivity, even if there's no change in market productivity, there's an increase in the real income of households. Make it, it wouldn't show up, or wouldn't show up very directly in terms of the market real income, but it would show up in terms of the relevant measure if that's determining utility. Okay? So I'm going, you know, I haven't made any assumptions about production functions yet other than no joint production. As in, in market case, I'm going to assume that the Fs are CRS. For the same reasons that uh, Kevin said, uh, and maybe even stronger reasons in, in the household case in, in some dimensions. And again, partly CRS is, is a, a framework. I mean, you'll find additional factors that bring you back to CRS, and some of them may be fixed or, or not. So I like to think of it largely as a framework. Uh, so I'm going to make the assumption that CRS. So, so if we have CRS, that means that if we look at the marginal cost of a particular commodity, <coughs> marginal cost, of I, that's a shadow marginal cost, that would be what? It would be pi i plus uh, pi i d z i d, d uh, I'm sorry. You get CRS. If you, if you have homothetic, you get CRS for free here, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. It's really the homothetic. units are not. Yeah, since right. the Z units are arbitrary, right. it really is homothetic. That the mix of inputs is invariant when you change out. Right. It doesn't really matter that there's CRS. Yeah. Homothetic would, uh, uh, would certainly give it to you for, for that reason. Oh, it's, in that sense, a weaker. So. It is a weaker. It sort of says the relative importance of time and goods depends on prices, but not on scale. Not on scale. And that's what I'm using here. This is going to be zero in CRS, so it's going to be simply equal to pi i. So the marginal price and the average price are exactly the same. Scale isn't important. Okay. That simplifies the analysis a lot, and there's a lot of motivation uh, for it. So then we have basically. Uh, we converted the problem into we converted the problem into a conventional problem uh, to some extent. So now we have the problem for the consumer uh, is max u equal u of z one subject to some i i z i equals to s. And the first order condition would be the same as usual, ui is equal to lambda pi i, okay. where the pi's are constant. So um, you have a linear budget constraint. So if you're looking in the z space, z1, z2, here's the slope of the budget planning. And you have some, the maximum would be here. Star, Z2 star, usual way. And you can also think of the problem as in, uh, in, in ordinary consumer theory in terms of the uh, dividing the uh, maximization into two, you know, two components. You look at the cost function, you minimize the cost for a given utility, 
and then you maximize your utility level. So we wrote down a cost function. So you write down the cost function. This cost function has all the properties of the usual cost function. It's concave, um, it's, it's symmetry, derivative, so you, you know that uh, CI is equal to CI, right? And uh, CII, DZI, DIII is less than zero. So if you have negative, negatively inclined demand, compensated negatively inclined demands for the commodities. Uh, this is for the commodities. Uh, increase in the price of commodity lowers your commodity demand holding utility constant. You have symmetry, DZI, D pi J is equal to D, D, J, D, I, I, symmetry, uh, hom homogeneous of degree zero demand, all, all the properties. All the properties follow because it's exactly the same as with ordinary theories. Okay. You got a more general, if you, if you eliminated this, the um, no joint production, you still have a cost function, just, it just uh, and you still have the uh, problem is still well defined, but it's, it's more general in, in that sense. It's a more general cost function. And, um, uh, but basically you carry through a, a, a related analysis. Now what's the, what, is, what are we really doing, particularly when we, uh, with the commodities? Well, what we're saying in part, let's, let's go back a little bit. Now we have this utility function. Now let's substitute in this utility, F1, X1, H1, F2, X2, H2, Fm, Xm, Hm. What we're, what we're really saying is we, we can look at the utility function given and here, of course, the assumption of no joint uh, production is important. Uh, but on that, uh, with that assumption, we can look at the utility function as being separable across blocks of time and good inputs. Right? Now, separability is often used as a way of simplifying and reducing the dimensionality of a problem. In this case, we have a way of at least motivating the separability in terms of different commodities that people are interested in. And what, what does separability give us? Well, look at it. Suppose we looked at VU, we looked at the first order conditions for, let's say, goods and time in a particular commodity. So we would say DU DXI would be DU DZI DZI DXI. And that's going to be equal, first order condition would be that should be equal lambda di, right? And then du dhi, household time, du dzi, dzi dhi, and that's equal to lambda times the cost of the time, which is w. You can see the du dzi's cancel out, the lambdas cancel out. And what do we have left with? We have PI over WI is equal to DZI DXI over DZI DHI. And what is this? This is a function only of XI and HI and any other things that enter into the production function of the i good. Doesn't depend upon anything else. Doesn't depend upon the level of Z's. And it doesn't, that's the CRS, and it doesn't depend upon the uh, XJs, HJs, or anything else in, in the system, all right? So we can isolate out the, uh, 
the substitution between the optimal goods and optimal time in a particular commodity from everything else, more or less, that's going on uh, in, in the system. I mean, the levels of Xi and Hi will depend upon the level of Z, which will depend upon real income and, and the like. Uh, uh, but the, it, it, with CRS, the proportions uh, will be independent of everything else. Okay. Uh, so that's what uh, separability uh, gives us in this problem. So you know, think of. Now, now you can think of it in terms of application. So I have an increase in the wage rate. What is that going to do to the demand for children, for example? A lot of literature on, uh, on that effect. Well, um, on the one hand, uh, if children are uh, raise the cost of children, maybe raise the cost of other goods, but if children are relatively time intensive, if these shares of time and goods are relatively high in children, and the cost of children are going to rise relative to other commodities, and that would be a, a you, know, you have a substitution effect away from children, right? That would be one effect. Also, uh, think of children as, as also child rearing. If your wage rate goes up, you'll substitute toward other services. Uh, Jesse mentioned before about something about you go out to the market services, I think, was when you go out to market services of various forms. So people whose time and are very valuable, they may have, they do have fewer children. You look at different studies, they do have fewer children, but they also, in raising the children, uh, they make more use of uh, preschool uh, programs, um, uh, uh, people they hire for child care and other devices to economize on their time. So they would be substituting in, both in terms of reduction of children, of, of, in this way, W goes up away from H and toward axis, and they will also be substituting uh, across commodities because the cost of different commodities rise by different amounts. So the cost of, of children may, being a time intensive commodity will rise by more than others, and therefore there'll be a substitution uh, away uh, from children compared uh, to other commodities. That's how you would try to analyze that. What happens, Gary, if they're if they got a higher wage because they're more productive in the market? What if they're also more productive raising kids? The productivity. Yeah, right, right, absolutely. Uh, well, let, let's throw that open. Well, let's say, let's say, let's say, in fact, hold market productivity fixed. What happens if I made you more productive? I'm going to come to some of those issues. Hold on. Okay. He's the only one with my good point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm good. We want, I like Just that. Just returning the favor. I like that. That's good. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Uh, and I'll come, I'll come to that. Because that's important. Another example, your wage rate goes up. Uh, what do you, uh, you look at the way you, and one of the things I say is your meals, uh, your eating. Well, you shift away from home preparation toward fast food, you put less time into it. So people who are working a lot in the marketplace at high wages, you know, they economize how much time they put in, in food preparation. They may eat out, they may have fast foods, um, uh, and they, they, they make a, a variety of, if they're high enough wages off cooks, uh, they do all these type of adjustments uh, as a way of economizing. Again, uh, this comes out of this uh, very, Okay. Gary, hasn't there been a trend recently towards bringing some kinds of activities back into the household that we sort of yeah. brought out of the household? Entertainment right. and things like that. I don't know if the data Yeah, there is. That. There is a trend. Well, you put one piece of data, you see that. Well, at, this, at the same time, that average household size has been going down quite sharply, you know, say the last 30 years. Income went up to some extent. Uh, Average household size went up enormously. I mean, yeah. average size of the physical, physical household yeah. size. Average home went up enormously. You know, part of that low interest rates and so on, but it wasn't only that. My interpretation along those lines would be that what we did was uh, see, traditional development theory says as countries develop, you take things out of the household, you put them into the so instead of baking your own bread, you buy them in the marketplace, right? 
So you, you think of development theory literature, that's an old idea, and, and there's some truth to it, obviously. We did do that to a large extent. But lately, we've been being bred back into the household. Right? And instead of going out to the movies, we are bringing movies back into the household. Why is that? That's the question that Jesse is pointing out. I think the reason for that is, is technological innovation in the marketplace that we can miniaturize a lot of activities so it's, it's efficient now to have them in the household. Why? Why is it more efficient to have it in the household? Not even just miniaturization, they've just gotten so cheap. Yeah, well, that's what I mean by miniaturization. One of the problems with the household is that they leave it idle all yeah. the time. Yeah. We need so cheap, capital so yeah. cheap. All I meant by miniaturization is we can do things cheaply on a small scale. You have the small, I mean, the first thing that happened was washing and drying machines. It used to be true. The families with any medium or high level of income, they gave their laundry out, and they would collect them every week, and they'd bring them back. They'd wash them, dry them, press them if you had to. People don't do that anymore. It's so cheap now. Then you have you had, before because you had these big washing machines, it was expensive to have one in your household. Now everybody has more or less. In, in rich countries has a washing machine and a dryer and a dishwasher and all that, you bring them into the household. So you save the commuting time or the inconvenience. You had to have somebody, even if, if somebody picked it up, you had to be home when they came. But you're working. When are you going to be available for them to pick it up? You can do it at night at, at your convenience. Same thing is true for um, you know movies. Instead of going out to the movies, only young people now go out to the movies. That's one of the problems with, with, with the demand for movie theaters. Only young people go. Most other people, they, they watch a lot of movies, but they watch them at home. You save on, on, on the cost of your time. And so a lot of activities like that, uh, it, uh, and again, it's fundamentally a time, I think it's fundamentally a time or convenience saving. I think we that's the two things. It's the time and the fact that capital has both gotten small, but it's also just gotten so cheap. Yeah. that you can project a movie. You can have all the equipment you need to project a movie, and you can afford to leave it idle 98% of the time. Whereas the when- The advantage the of a movie, movie theater is the projector is always running. It's, it's, it's always yeah, running. Yeah, is most of the time not running. Yeah, Although well, you'd be surprised how often yeah. people do this. But I mean, they have, people have all these assets that they use. Like they have this, you know, they have this machine that they use once every, you know, right. once a washing, month. Washing that's, what I mean. on that's, that's what I meant by miniature. Right. These things have become cheaper right. to have them in the household. It's both that they're smaller and they're easier to yeah. put in the household. Yeah. Well, than because, because, you know, you, you want to something you share small for the household, but if it's too expensive, right. yeah. then, uh, right. you don't want. I so, think, so two things have happened. The relative price of the small versions have gotten cheaper, and just the whole thing has gotten cheaper. The capital goods have gotten so no, cheap that no you can afford yeah. to leave them yeah. idle. Right. I mean, they've gotten cheaper than, say, having well, a human service, another dimension of substitution, you know, maids and, and health yes. has gotten more expensive. So a lot of people, it, it was, say, 100 years ago, people in moderate incomes always had a, a maid coming in. Now a lot of families don't because they've substituted the way. Uh, maids have gotten cheaper. Their time has gotten cheaper, too, and more expensive. Maids have gotten more expensive, but these other things have become so much more cheaper. And again, you. It, it, it's cheaper and you can do them more conveniently. Uh, say a dishwasher, you don't have to worry about washing dishes anymore. You have washing machines that dries, you can do them when you want, and so on. So what, what's happening is I think the household is getting bigger because more activities are coming back into the household. Maybe that's like bowling alone. People are gonna be, <laughs> like, you know the book Bowling Alone, uh, that the lack, uh, the decline in social networking in the United States. Um, well, some controversy over how much that has happened. I think it has happened in part because it's become more economical to have, do things in your home rather than out. So still you worry about social networks, but social networks has its price. And if the relative cost of that has gone up, like everything else, you make your substitutions. Yes. How much of this do you think is due to a uh, change in preferences over time? For example, um, in the past, making food was just making food. Now it's been glamorized to making gourmet food. And it's become partially leisure. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, I, I like to use, uh, go to change in preferences at a last resort. Change in preferences is the uh, ultimate uh, uh, fallback of this, of this somebody who doesn't explain, doesn't have a real way of explaining something. And maybe it has been sung, but I think you have other variables that have been operating that will go in that direction. For example, take making your own bread. Right? It, it's become, yes, it's become glamorized, but it's also, and I think underlying it becoming more glamorized now, you have very efficient home bread machines, not much work involved, and you can knock off the bread and pretty good quality bread uh, easily. A major innovation, you didn't have that not that long ago. Right? The Cuisinart first and then other developments. I think that's what's been pushing it. Now, once you push it, social interactions may add some glamour to it. So you have to think of what's the forcing variable here. I think it's the change in the cost of this equipment. And then through social interactions, maybe you get the glamour. It looks like it's a change in taste, but it isn't really a change in taste. It's a response to, uh, I think, the fact that these have become a lot more cheap and convenient to use. And the quality has gone up a lot. So my wife makes a, a lot of bread, you know, she's a full-time worker uh, in the labor force because um, it's, it's, so, it's so convenient to do that now. The quality is good. And so instead of having to go to a shop and get bread, you can do it at home much more readily. Okay, any other questions? All right. Now I wanted to say a word about multiple households. You, you mentioned that earlier, and I said I would get to that point. I wasn't just dodging your question. Okay. Uh, it's an old dodge of teachers to say they'll get to it later and they don't get to it. <laughs> but, um, uh, I will get to it. The analysis has, has an interesting extension to multiple households. So think of now. Yeah. Two, two dimensions. Think of now these household productions. Here we have the ZI. the time of each of them. So now think of the multiple household problems as, again, subdivided into two problems. Cost minimization in the production of any given set of disease, and then some utility maximization. I'll come to that a little more explicitly. So, suppose, I mean, Suppose it were true that the household is always on the utility possibility frontier of the two household members. So you're all familiar with the concept of utility possibility frontier. Suppose you have UM, UF, they could be anywhere, but this is the boundary. This is what I mean by the frontier of the boundary. Now wherever they end up, and I'll come to where the, what determines where they end up, they're on the frontier. Right. So then, there's, a, there's just as strong an incentive, even stronger in a two-member household to be efficient. So given the set of commodities, they would minimize the cost of producing those commodities, just as a single household would be. Recognizing the only extension would be now you have time inputs of both members of the household rather than a single. So you still have, you have a cost function, you go through it, uh, and you're minimizing costs. Okay. Okay. That's the first stage of the problem. The second stage of the problem, so in that case, let's suppose, uh, as traditionally, historically, uh, women's wages were less than men's. So in, in this cost minimization, for any given set of disease, they would recognize that women's time, that wife's time, it's cheaper than that of the husband's time, and they would allocate their time across uh, uh, work and household activity in response to the difference in the cost of the different components of time. Okay. That's what they would do. Uh, regardless 
of who ends up with how much utility. They would want to do that efficiently. So it's efficiency, right? Being on the frontier guarantees you want to be efficient. The second stage of the problem would be uh, where you end up on this frontier. You know? and so think of the overall utility as some, some weighted average of the utility L and utility female. All right. And these weights, these weights would be determined by bargaining power, laws, maybe the laws discriminate against women, as many have done historically. Um, and so that weight would determine where you end up on the frontier. The higher the uh, <coughs> tau, uh, higher tau, the more you, you're in this section rather than that section. Okay? So then you decide, well, we know what the minimization for any set of commodities are. Then we pick the commodities, production of different commodities that match the utility functions of the husband and wife and the weights attached to their utility. So if the husband has a lot of weight, maybe uh, the commodity, uh, you'll have a lot of weight on leisure time of the husband, for example, an income effect to the husband, or on uh, orienting television watching towards sports, uh, uh, for example. Uh, as a weight shift, you, you change your, your, your allocation. So the two-person household it fits very naturally into the same framework. Now, did I answer your question again before? You did. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Well, we're at, we're out of time, so I'll pick up and continue this tomorrow.